everyone, Shabbat Shalom. Today is Saturday. Um, I am doing a prophetic update and recording this live so that I can get it all out there without my camera filling up on storage. There's been a lot happening and I haven't felt confident enough to share the latest things that God's been doing in my life. So I just feel like I'm going to share it now and pray that it doesn't fall void. So I'm going to start over with the beginning for, um, I hate when I'm live and the screen's doing all this stuff and telling me to do all these things because it's distracting. And then I hope I, I need to figure out how to not let people join with me because my phone will be blowing up. I don't know how to do that though. I don't know if it'll let me mute people trying to join. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to start from the beginning about my journey as a coming into a prophet. So I was raised Southern Baptist. I went to a really, um, really good church growing up in the South called Bellevue Baptist Church. We were under Dr. Adrian Rogers. He was amazing. And he really taught us to have a heart for the Lord, to learn to discern God from within. We learned about the spirit realm. We learned about um, the testing and trials that we would go through. And it really set a really good foundation for me um, living in the prophetic realm. And then when I was 18, around, around my high school years, that pastor passed away. And it really shook our church because like half of the church left and went to other churches. So I no longer felt home there. I didn't feel like I vibed with the new leader and all that. Um, and then I got into the college ministry and everyone that I was really close with either left church or moved away to a different college. And so I, I no longer felt at home in my church. And during that time, we had gone through some familial trauma and we had lost my sister's first baby. And so a bunch of things just kind of shook our foundation. During that time, um, my family left the faith and I had to figure out what was true and it really traumatized me. So I spent the next, from probably 18 to 24, trying to figure out what was true. And I backpacked all over Europe. I studied every religion I can get my hands on. Um, and then I ended up having my daughter I heard my daughter call me to be born, and so I conceived her that night, and she changed my world. And so after having her, I was like, I have another soul to, to provide for, for their um, spiritual life, so I need to figure out what's true about God. And so for two years, I was a stay-at-home mom. I had already left her dad, but I was in my parents' house doing photography, and so um, I had a lot of free time, and I spent all that time reading religious scriptures from every religion and figuring out what I believed to be true. And I landed on becoming a Messianic Jew because of things that I don't feel like going into right now. So I found my faith again. And then uh, from 24 to 32, I went through a lot of trials, um, a lot of trials. And I ended up getting married and that marriage uh, traumatized me. It completely destroyed my soul once that was over. Um, but during the divorce, Leading up to this point, I had always known how to hear God, how to discern spirits. But again, I came from a really good church and that was common. That was normal. We would talk about that with each other um, in our church groups. And so when I was going through my divorce, God would tell me to go do things that made no sense. Like he told me, go put on your blue dress and walk around the Nashville mall three times. And I was like, I don't even have a blue dress. And I went to my closet and there was a blue dress in the back of the corner. So I put that on. He told me to cover my head. I was like, my husband's gonna think I'm an idiot. Like, what am I doing? And I went and I walked around the mall and nothing happened and it, it just didn't make sense. And he kept telling me to do these random things and he told me, I'm testing your obedience. I'm testing your faith even when it doesn't make sense because I'm about to take you on a big journey. And um, he also kept showing me the book of Jeremiah and I would flip to Jeremiah because um, you're taught that if you need a word from God, you ask God for a word and you open your Bible and it'll be a word for you. Well, it was always Jeremiah where God was saying, I'm making you a prophet to rebuild the kingdom of Israel and restore the nation, restore the lost tribes. And I was like, God, what does this mean? Are you making me a prophet? And he was like, yeah. But I would also ask, why am I going through such intense warfare? Why am I being so hurt and traumatized and why are you destroy allowing satan to destroy my marriage and he would always take me to the old testament where it was talking about um the the curses from sin and i was like 
I don't feel like I've sinned. I don't deserve this. I'm so mad because he would always take me to those verses about for your sin, you're going to go through all this, all this trauma. But now, you know, almost a decade later, I'm like, yeah, I, I was being uh, purged of generational sin and rebellion. And, and you have to reap what you sow. And it goes generationally. The sins pass down generation after generation, but so do the blessings. And so if your ancestors weren't acting right, you will have to suffer the consequences of that, just like generational poverty. Okay, here we go. I'm not adding you guys because every time people try and join me, they're never from America. They always speak a different language and they just stare at me the whole time. It's odd. And if, if people that speak English want to join, I'll be happy to talk with you on a different time, but it never is. And I just sit there being stared at. I don't understand it. So, and now it's telling me to swipe. It's so strange. Um, okay. So you're going through generational purging. You're reaping what you sow. It's all karma. And what you reap is what you sow. And this goes through your bloodline and your genetics. I have lots of videos explaining why bad things happen to good people. First of all, there are no good people. Otherwise, we wouldn't be on this planet of sin. We'd be with God in heaven if we were perfect. So you're reaping what generationally you have sown. And so I just accepted it. I was like, fine, if this is deserved, I will just break all the generational curses of my family, even though I don't feel like I did anything wrong, but I will be the one to break the cycles. I will be the one to go through hell so that my family, my children can have a better life than what I had. And so he kept saying, I'm going to make you a prophet to rebuild the kingdom of Israel, restore the lost tribes. And I fought that for a long time because I did not come from a, a background of understanding prophecy. We didn't have prophets. And so that was really peculiar to me. I just thought that I knew how to hear God and that God spoke to all of us, but I didn't really understand that there were designated prophets anymore. And, and maybe there weren't, and maybe it's just because we're in the awakening and now there are prophets rising up again. That could be what it is. So, um, I went through the divorce, my daughter's father, a different man also, um, left us at the same time. And I was forced to be alone to take care of my daughter and myself. And I was on my deathbed. We were, her and I were both passing out every day. I, we were really, it wasn't good. I don't need to go into all that. Um, and so um, I was put into a alternative healing practice and I have, I had a private practice and I was healing people or, you know, guiding them on their healing journey with God. But I had no one there for me. And God was like, you need to know how to hear me so that you can help other people and not be codependent for your needs because you're the one that's going to help other people. And it comes directly from God. So he grew me for the past five or six years in that. Um, but he kept giving me prophetic words over people. And with my clients, it always came true. I would speak a word and it would come true. Um, and sometimes it takes years for it to come true, but I could see the progress. Um, and then um, 2020 happened and I had a vision. We had, we had an earthquake in Utah. And that fall, I had a vision of an, uh, another earthquake. Like I was literally living it. And I was like, something's coming, something's coming. And I kept putting these words out and I was going live and I was like, something's coming. You guys, you need to stock up, get your food ready. There's, you know, cause that, there's a shaking. Um, and then I got a word that the earthquake in the West coast was going to happen. Uh, so I was pre preaching, you need to repent. You need to repent. It's happening. And then I heard it was going to happen on September 23rd. And then I found out that was judgment day when we go into Libra, there were all these other prophecies saying the same thing. And someone shared my video and it went to like 60,000 people in two days. Um, all these people were messaging me like, I hear it too, I'm getting out. And then the day of September 23rd, nothing happened. And so I got on live and I said, I guess it, I was being deceived. It must have been delusion. And hundreds of people flooded in and they're like, no, it worked. You had a Jonah moment. And this was my first experience with God asking me to give a public prophecy like to the nation. Um, and then when it didn't happen, I was so confused. But what I learned in that was I wasn't, I was saying repent. I was telling people you need to repent. So all these hundreds of people were like, no, we know that that word was true. And we repented and God relented. You had a Jonah moment. So I learned, it blew my mind. I was like, oh my goodness. So God doesn't want to destroy us. He wants us to repent and he will send his prophets to warn you like he did with Jonah and Nineveh. Um, the same thing happened to them where he said, I'm going to destroy it in 40 days. He gave a date. He said, you're going to be destroyed. He didn't say repent even, but the people heard it. They repented and God relented. And so, 
um, that, that was my first prophecy to, to more than just one person at a time. Um, and then over, over the next few years, I had more things. God told me, put your crown on, you're building a kingdom, just little things to grow my faith. And then he told me, um, I want you to open a wellness center by May, May 1st. And he only gave me like three months to do it. And I ended up doing it. And the contract that I got said, you get your keys May 1st. So, you know, I get dates. So people that tell you that God doesn't give you dates, they don't know God because God gives me dates all the time. And so he's been showing me how he's raising me up. He's bringing me up into my kingdom calling and what he's doing with me, he's doing with you too. You just have to trust it. So he put me in my kingdom calling and I opened the wellness center and everything just skyrockets. And before I opened it, he said, I want you to give your brother a thousand dollars. I didn't have it. So I'd do a cash advance on my credit card. Um, and then I opened the wellness center. Everything went amazingly. Um, and then he said, he gave me a, a vision that spring of 2023, last spring, where we had so much rain. And I heard God say, I'm, I'm, I'm sending rain. I'm raining down blessings and abundance on the righteous, but wrath on the, on, um, the unrighteous. So I, did a, I spoke a word about that. Um, and then I had a vision where I was hiking on a trail with my daughter. This was in May of last year. I was hiking on a trail with my daughter and we were looking for a place to build our luxury home. That was in my dream. We were like, oh, let's, let's, let's build our luxury home. And in the dream, I had a husband because he was out looking at the platform. So we see this cliff overlooking the valley and we're like, this is where we're going to build it. But there's no roads. There's no way to get there. And all of a sudden, I look to my left over the cliff, and a helicopter is bringing my entire home in a net and sets it down and flies away. And then I wake up, and I hear God say a few things. I hear him say, I'm, le I'm leveling you up. I'm raising you up. Um, I'm making a way where there is no way. And out of that vision, I got, okay, I'm going to be married. And I also got um, that the move will be will be easy because it will be shipped for me. I won't have to do it. Um, so I want to backtrack because I do, I am going to talk about this one thing that I didn't think I was going to talk about. So in 2020, I was told that the guy I was dating, that I was going to marry him and that I was going to have his son and the son's name would be River and that I would have him by the time I'm 42. And I learned that my aunt and grandmother also had their sons at 42 so I was like, okay, that's validation. So I told him all this and he was like, I don't know. I'm not ready. I just, um, wish we we're on the same page. So I was like, maybe I'm delusional. Maybe you're just dragging me along and messing with my brain. So I was like, you need to leave me alone so I can figure this out. Um, so I haven't talked to that guy in three years, but God still told me, he said, don't date, send him words when I tell you. So I send him encouragement and I'll text him maybe once a month or something. Um, and so that's that. Okay. So, um, last summer, God said, it's time to go pack your bags because the plan is to open wellness centers all over the nation, as well as a retreat center and a school. And he said, it's time to go pack your bags. And I'm thinking, I am not moving a five bedroom house across the country. And I remember the vision God gave me where the house was shipped. So I was like, okay, I'll put everything in shipping boxes. So I loaded up and then God said, my mom was like, well, why don't you come live with us while you're trying to sell your house? And I, I did not want to do that, but I ended up doing that. And right as I move into my parents' house, everything crumbles. I almost lose my business. Um, I'm being satanically attacked where I'm getting scratches, like demonic scratches on my body. Uh, my mental health is terrible. My brother verbally abused me like none other. Um, really, really bad um, things happening because, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a testing is what you're going through. So that's been a year and a half and I've just been kind of floating along and I had a word for a church last year. I know this is scattered, but there's so many things that God does that I'm trying to remember it all on the timeline. So last year I was at a church and I had a prophetic word for the church. So I ran up to the front and I said, I see diamonds surfacing and, and I said, God says that you're ready. You've been through the pressure 
like coal has to go through intense pressure to be made into a diamond. I said, and, and with all the rain, the topsoil has been washed away and you're ready. You're exposed. You're ready to rise up. You're ready to step into your kingdom calling and you're valuable because you're a diamond and you're uncrushable now because you're a diamond. You're ready. You're ready to go through what God has for you. You're ready to step into your calling. You're ready to learn what it sounds like intuitively to hear God so that he can guide you. Um, so I gave that word and then I sat down and I heard God say, this word was for this church and this pastor. I'm doing something new, but the pastor doesn't know what it is yet. So I go tell the pastor and I was like, um, have you heard that God's going to do something new in your church? And he said, yeah. And I said, but you don't know what it is yet. And he said, I get bits and pieces, but when you gave that word, I knew what it was. And so I wrote down everything and I gave it to him. And then I found out he had he he went on an eight month sabbatical after that word where he went to heal his inner child. And that's what I do for a living is I help people heal their inner child because when you heal the generational trauma, that's what makes you grow closer to God because the trauma is based in sin and sin separates you from God. So by healing the trauma, you no longer have that sin to hold you under the curse and you wake up and you elevate and you grow closer to God. And um So I went back after he came back from the sabbatical and I had another word and I came into the church and I heard God say, give, give him your menorah. And it's a really nice menorah. And I I didn't want to do it, but you know that it's God because it goes against your flesh. You don't want to do what God's asking you to do. So I was like, fine, I'll give him my menorah. And then I heard God say, I'm making this church a messianic synagogue. I've been talking to the, the preacher about all of this. It's about restoring Israel, bringing back the lost tribes, making the two one again. And I'm going to make this a messianic synagogue. And I didn't want to tell him that because that's a really bold statement to tell a pastor that's not Jewish or messianic. So I was like, I'm not going to say that. So I told my daughter and my friend that were with me. Um, And then at the end of the service, the worship leader said, if you need to leave, go ahead. But it's it's important that you stay because this is important. And she said, I want everyone right now to focus on the prophetic realm. Everyone has the gift of prophecy, and I want you to pray right now and ask God for a word. And if he gives you a word for someone, go share it with them. And I was like, dang, now I got to go tell the pastor that his church is going to be a messianic synagogue. So I run over to the pastor and I tell him all that. I was like, have you been hearing God tell you more about Judaism? And he was like, what? And I was, I repeated it and he goes, yeah. And I was like, okay, I don't want to say too much, but I'm just going to throw it all out there. And he was like, you're in a safe space. So I tell him, I said, God said that this is going to be a messianic synagogue. It's about uniting all of Israel back into one because the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. And now it's restoration of the church. And he was like, okay, thank you. And I said, I'm going to, I got to give you my menorah. And so as I'm leaving, I see a mezuzah on the door of the church, which you know is only something you'll see in a Jewish home or Jewish uh, place of work or church. It's a, it's the, Torah scroll of Hero Israel, the Lord our God, our God is one, and it'll be on the, cor- the doorpost. And I ran upstairs. I said, Did you put that mezuzah on the door? And he said, Yeah. So that was God letting me know that word is true. So um, I get these words all the time. And, and so I, I went home after my first prophetic word the year before about the diamonds rising up. And I made a video coming out saying, Okay, I'm accepting the call as a prophet. I'm not going to think I'm crazy anymore. I'm not going to push this down to make other people feel more comfortable because people think it's weird. I'm embracing who I am in my calling with Christ. And I don't care if people don't like me. I'm going to be who I am. And that was a year ago. And so now I'm okay to be like, yes, I'm a prophet. I can help you. What do you need? And I don't care if people think it's weird or don't believe me or be like, you're not a prophet. You know, it's just, that's their problem. So I've been sharing my journey because God told me when it was time to move, he said, you need to go public and share your journey. And again, it's, it's just like, man, I am so weird. People are going to think I'm so weird and crazy, but you have to be okay to be crazy. And he told me last year when I was moving my house, he said, for your obedience, you're going to get your BMW. And now that doesn't make sense to the church world because to the church world, um, prosperity is evil, but God is a prosperous God. And for your obedience, he prospers and blesses you abundantly. And so I've always wanted a BMW. And he said, for your obedience, you're going to get your BMW. So I recorded myself saying that. And I was like, this is crazy, but I'm just going to say it. So a, a few months later, I'd already moved out. The house was on the market. Someone drives out and totals my car. And God said, now go get your BMW. So I got it. 
And, and God is showing me that when you sacrifice everything in your life to obey the call, even to the point that people think you are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, at least Satan tells you that, he will bless you with all the desires of your heart. And so now I'm in this weird limbo, um, just waiting for the call. And um, I feel like there's a door opening for the move. I feel like there's a door, like I don't feel as many blockages. And um, so my daughter and I will listen to prophetic words to see if we get any um, confirmations. And there were a bunch of words saying, you're gonna, God's gonna make a way where there is no way and you'll know in a few months, in a few weeks. And every word said that. And that phrase, God's gonna make a way where there is no way speaks to me because that's what he told me in my vision. And I have no idea what that means. So I was like, okay, we're gonna know in a few weeks. And um, there's so much, I'm getting overwhelmed. There's so much. My life is constantly in the prophetic realm. So this gets jumbled. <clears throat> um, during this season of healing and elevating, God would tell me, you need to be okay to be seen. Cause when you go through trauma, you want people to leave you alone because people are mean and they hurt you. But he would tell me, you, you need to be okay to be seen. And he showed me when I first started my career that I would be coaching and teaching and traveling and opening wellness centers and retreats and all that. And, um, he, uh, my dog's barking. Um, so he moved me to a house on a corner of a busy street and I would get honked at every day and I hated it. And my clients would drive by and be like, Sarah. And I was just like, Oh, I don't want to be seen. I want people to just leave me alone. And um, I would try and get people to come work in my yard so I didn't have to be out there. And God was like, no, you need to be okay to be seen. Get out there and work in your yard. Let people haunt. Let people know that you're there. And so I did. And then he said, I want you to put a sign on your house to let certain people that aren't online know that you're there. And I fought that for months. And God kept waking me up to some scripture verses that I listened to at night where it would say, your enemies will come in one way but flee seven and he would wake me up every night when that verse would be spoken and he would say Sarah you have angels around you nothing's gonna harm you when you're under my protection because you're obeying me so I put a sign on my house and I got a lot of clients from that and nothing happened it was fine no one murdered me so then um, he keeps saying you need to be okay to be seen put yourself out there so I spoke at a conference on healing and then I went on a TV show that should be airing in the next few months. So I'm trying to put myself out there and be okay to be seen and be strong in who I am because this is an example for you to be okay to be different. Don't worry about what people think about you. Answer the call and because the call will come with a lot of blessings and it'll be exciting and it will give your life meaning and purpose. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, now I'm in this transition and, oh yeah, I was going to tell you, God told me make all of your social media accounts public. And I'm like, fine, whatever. Because again, I'm weird and people are going to be talking about me and gossiping about me that have no lives and want to just talk about me because that's all they have to talk about. Um, so I made my accounts public and then God said, I want you to let all of these people from different countries in as friends. And I was really scared because I've been scammed before out of hundreds of dollars. And you see all those scammer shows where they're all like in these call centers in India or something. So I was really scared because I'm like, these people are going to steal my photos and catfish people or make fake accounts and try and scam people out of money. Or they're going to try and scam me and tell me that they have these orphanages and need me to fund their orphanages that probably aren't real. And he goes, Sarah, how can you help my people if you're afraid of them? So I was like, fine. So I opened it up and I did get, tried to get scammed. People would call me through my messenger at 3 a.m. Like every day I'd get multiple calls and all these fake stuff. And I would just block them and weed through them. But here's the thing. I had a vision um, where I was in a white dress on top of a mountain and people were coming up the mountain to learn from me. And I know that sounds egotistical, but the Bible says when you obey God, People will come to you from all over the world to learn from you because if you're listening to God, he's going to use you to teach. And so I had this vision and um, he told me to put my crown on, right? So there's a crown. And I was like, he, he told me, Sarah, it's time. They're ready. Everyone's ready to rise up. It's time. We're having a revival. And I said on my Facebook, I said, 
I feel like God's telling me to do something, but I want to know if there's a prophet that can tell me what my vision was without me saying anything like the king did in, in the Bible with Daniel. And this guy that I had just let in from Kenya, you know, I was scared to let these people become friends with me, but I let them in. And this guy that I had just let in from Kenya messages me and he says, Sarah, I see you on top of a mountain with a white dress and you're crowned as a queen and people are coming to learn from you. And I was like, oh my gosh, he told me my exact vision. He saw me in a white dress, everything. And I was like, that's crazy. And so shortly after that, one of my TikToks went somewhat viral and so God was like, look, when I tell you it's time, I'm going to do it for you. You don't have to, it's not going to be that hard. I'm going to do it for you. So he did it for me. And then I was like, well, if there's a revival, what does that mean? Because I was always taught the end of time would be the Antichrist and tribulation and horrible things. I've never been taught a revival. And he shows me the book of Joel where in the end of days, God restores the lost tribes of Israel back into covenant. And he said, this is where we are. We're in restoration and so now I'm giving those words about restoration. It's the tribes of Israel that have been scattered and lost and forgot who they were, waking up and remembering who they are. And, and so then I'm sharing that and this revival, this end time awakening, this end time shaking. <clears throat> so you're, if you're being called, you need to answer the call because you're a part of the revival. You're going to be used to help guide people and help people. And so then I'm like, you know... If all these visions I'm having are coming true, let's go bigger. Let's go way bigger. Because everything I've ever asked God for, He's given to me. But I haven't been asking for anything extravagant. I mean, a BMW is extravagant to me. But I was like, let's go bigger. And because my faith is growing stronger. So I was like, all right, God. I want a retreat center where I can help people heal. And I want to hold the biblical feast days at my house. Why not? let me ask for like a plantation mansion home on land that has enough room for banquets and camping for the Feast of Tabernacles and revival and worship. And, you know, let, let me be the house that everyone feels welcome at where people can come and, and learn about you so that I don't have to have a house and a retreat center. Just let me have this mansion where that is the retreat center. And so I'm asking for this mansion now because I'm like, hey, let's just, it doesn't hurt to ask. And so then I hear God say, there's this um, secondhand store. I want you to go look at it because there's furniture that you're going to like. So I was like, okay, maybe that means we're about to move. So I, I try to go to the secondhand store and I miss the turn. So I do a U-turn and I end up in the parking lot of another secondhand store that I didn't know was there. So I was like, maybe I'll go in here first. And I walk in and there's this antique, immaculate, expensive, really fine furniture. And I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, God, I could house a whole house. I could furnish a whole house with this. And it like hurt my heart. And I was talking to the people and they said, yeah, we're, we're felons and we're convicts and we're addicts. And this is an academy where people donate, wealthy people donate their leftover furniture from estate sales to us to help uh, fund our academy to get us back on our feet. And I was like, this is amazing. And the thrift store is called The Other Side Thrift. It's in Mill Creek and Salt Lake. Uh, uh, no, Murray, Murray and Mill Creek. It's called the, uh, the other side thrift and the people there are awesome. And it's a great, it supports great things. So I went home and I, I just kept thinking about this furniture and I heard God say, if you want a mansion, go buy furniture. That's going to furnish a mansion. And I was like, dude, I don't have any money. I'm living on credit cards right now. But I was like, let's just try. Cause worst case scenario, I'll just resell it. So I go and I end up buying $2,500 on my credit card. And the furniture that I got was about $15,000 to $20,000 new. So I got really good furniture. And if you guys are in Utah, go to this thrift store and you'll know what I'm talking about. I got an Ethan Allen bed, like a canopy bed that sells for $4,000. I got it for $650. And so it's going to be shipped here on Wednesday to put into another shipping container to move. Um, and these are the things I haven't shared yet because I'm like, I don't know. I don't see how this would happen. I have no money you know, I'm an only parent. I live in my parents' house right now. You're going to have to make a way where there is no way. You're going to have to part the water. So, but I bought the furniture. And um, when I was looking at different mansions online, I heard God say, go bigger. Go bigger. Where's your faith? You can move mountains with faith. Go bigger. So I was like, all right. So I looked at a bigger house with 10 acres of land. 
and it had a beautiful greenhouse and a guest house and a lake. And I'm like, I can see so much here. I could see so much here. And cause you're, you're here for the kingdom of God. You're building the kingdom. And, um, so now I'm in waiting for that. And when I gave these words about revival, God was really speaking through me and I was prophesying. Well, then comes the testing and the shaking. Satan comes to my mind this week and he is, he's just making me doubt and question. And he's like, give up, just move out, just go get an apartment, give up, give up, give up. God didn't say that. And you're never going to do this. You won't ever be able to move. You're never going to be happy. You're going to be alone and isolated in Utah working your whole life. You know, you know how Satan does. And I know from my experience that when you get through a point where you want to give up, that's when a breakthrough is about to come. And most people can't handle that trial and temptation and mental anguish. And so they do give up. But I didn't give up because God, I had angels around me keeping me strong So I didn't give up, but I called a friend and I said, I'm about to reach a breakthrough because I'm having the worst mental anguish right now. I'm being tormented. And she goes, call me tomorrow and let me know what happens. And so the next day, the guy that I believe I'm supposed to marry texts me after three years of no contact. And remember, I'm in a trial right now. Satan's telling me to give up. And he tells me, I'm in Tennessee constantly and I think about you. Um, Like, I think you're great. However, I've been seeing someone for a while that I would like to marry, and um, I don't want you to wait and hope I'll come around. You deserve to move on and be happy. Um, and I was like, what? I was like, that, that makes no sense, because last month, God told me to send him these videos about many other plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's will that prospers, and lean on, on your own understanding um, like trust the Lord with, with all his ways, lean not on your own understanding. And then there was a video that said, um, if you're trying to hold on to what God is telling you to let go of, it will become putrid. So I sent him all these things cause he's very stubborn and he doesn't listen to God. He does his own way. So I was like, sure, I'll send those to him. He's probably rebelling. And then he tells me to move on, you know, like a month later. And I'm like, what is happening? And I told him, I said, if those words that I sent you were telling you to let go of this girl that you're with, then I rebuke you, Satan, because that's a demon telling you to marry her because I know what I heard from God is not wrong. And the fact that you're in Tennessee constantly and thinking about me, that's a God move. And the fact that you're reaching out now when I'm being tormented and told to give up, that's the devil. And so I said, I rebuke you, Satan. And I said, you do what you do. I'm going to do what I do. But I don't believe I'm wrong because if I'm wrong about you, I'm wrong about everything in my life and I will have to give up. So do you see what Satan's doing? He's tr- he will try and force you to go against what God's telling you. So I passed the test. So the next day I had clarity of mindset and all these prophetic words were like, you you reached your breakthrough, you passed your test. Um, and so I called my friend and told her all that. But during the time that this guy messaged me to give up, a prophet, the prophet from Kenya messaged me. He said, Sarah, I'm fasting and I see you again in a vision. God's using you don't give up. He's doing great things in your life. He said, but Sarah, I'm a poor man on a different continent. Why is God showing me visions of you? I don't understand what's happening. I said, I do. You're an angel. God is sending you to strengthen me. And I told him that this guy is telling me to give up. And I said, what do you think? He goes, it's a test. He said, don't give up. What's meant for you will be for you. And, um, and so I listened to that word and I was like, okay, I'm not going to give up. I'm, I'm going to hold true to the word because if I give up on this, then I'm wrong in everything. And so there's just so many things happening, but I feel like it's important to talk about it because when you're in a season of testing and trials, it means you're about to reach your breakthrough. It happened to Jesus. Right before Jesus went to the cross, he went through the testing in the wilderness and Satan said, did God really say that? The same way he said it in the, in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? No, he didn't say that. Jesus, go ahead and turn this rock into a loaf of bread and feed yourself. You're hungry. Go drink water. Give up. Give up. It's too hard. It's never going to happen. You can't be that strong. If you're really the son of God, throw yourself off the cliff and see if you fly. See if angels catch you. This is how Satan works. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to throw you off course because you're powerful and you're strong and you're dedicated to God and the kingdom. So you can't 
let Satan convince you that you're not right about what God has convinced you that you are right about. And this is how the journey takes. It, it can take years and it can be confusing. And there are so many seasons and some seasons are overflow and some seasons are testing and trials. And right now I see a door opening, but I don't know what that means. But what I'm asking for is this plantation mansion so that I can help people that need help. And I can be a place of comfort where people that don't have anywhere to go can come to and I can host revivals and I can host retreats and I can host camping and worship and, um, you know, fun. You know, I can host things there. Whereas if I have a regular house in a neighborhood, I'm a little bit more limited. Um, And also I want to show how much God gives you when you're working for the king of the universe, the creator of the universe. You'll get the best of the best. That's what the blessings are. When you obey God, you'll get the best of the best. And the world will come to you to learn because they see that you're doing it right. And so I was listening to these prophetic words yesterday about um, you reached your breakthrough. You passed the test. And um, all of a sudden, I hear God tell me the reason that you had to give up everything in your home and go live in your parents' house with nothing because all of our belongings are in storage The reason you had to give up everything for the past year plus is because I needed you to sacrifice everything you had to answer the call for me so that I would know that you were worthy of what I'm about to give you. And it made so much sense. God always asks you for a sacrifice before he blesses you to see if you're worthy of it. And just like with Abraham, he got the calling to lead many nations, to be the father of many nations, but he had to be willing to sacrifice his own child to receive that because God will test your faith because he's seeing, are you going to be strong enough to carry what I'm about to give you because you're given a mantle and that's a high calling with a lot of pressure and a lot of testing and a lot of trials. And he wants to know that he can trust you to lead a lot of people And you're not going to go about it your way. You're going to do it God's way. So that's what I'm doing right now. So he told me, pack your whole house, take nothing with you and go to your parents and live. And I did. And it's been a year and we've had to rebuy bicycles. I had to rebuy a trampoline because we had nothing. I had to rebuy clothes. But each time it's been better. My daughter's phone was stolen from her and God was like, go get an upgrade. Don't let it defeat you. We're leveling up. And so the obedience and the sacrifice brings the blessings. It brings the promise. So if you're going through a trial and you've had to sacrifice everything or you're being asked to sacrifice everything, it's because you're being tested to see if you're worthy of the blessing, which will be much bigger. It always comes back bigger. You'll get a raise, you get a promotion, you get, you get something better than what you had before. It's like that picture where Jesus is holding a huge teddy bear behind his back and he's asking the little girl to give the small teddy bear because he has something better, but you have to give up what no longer serves you. So that's where I am. I think I've told you all my prophetic experiences. I think I've updated everything on this. Um, I was hesitant to share this because I'm like, I'm telling people that I'm asking God for a mansion and I don't know that that's possible because right now I have nothing. And but I want to share it because I haven't been wrong. And so how could I be wrong in this if I've been right in everything else? And I want to fight the devil because he just fought me. And so I want to fight him back by sharing this word, standing on faith and proclaiming that God is who he is. And when you read Deuteronomy, God tells you that if you disobey my law, all these cursings will come upon you and your generations. But if you obey my law, All these blessings come upon you. You will be the head, not the tail. You will be the lender, not the borrower. You will be, um, everything you touch will prosper. The fruit of your womb will prosper. And in my home, I had everything I had asked for. I had a, I I gardened my whole home. And God told me, because I knew I wasn't going to live there long. And I was like, God, why am I spending so much money gardening my yard? He said, it's for someone else. So I knew that it was going to be for someone else, but that still hurts your heart when you no longer have your garden to go work in or the food to eat from your garden. You know, someone else is eating my peach trees and my grapevines that I never really got to eat of because they were growing during that, those seasons. And, um, you know, I gave, up, I gave up my independence as a woman, as an adult. I gave up my home. I gave up my freedom. Um, I gave up every, everything that I had. It's all in storage. But now I know why, because God was testing me to see, 
Are you answering the call? Will you give up everything that you hold dear to yourself to answer what I'm saying? And I did. So will you answer the call? Will you sacrifice what he's asking you to sacrifice? Will you quit your job? Will you make the move? Will you turn down the promotion? Whatever God is asking you to do. And in the case of my kingdom spouse, will he turn down this woman that he wants to marry for a kingdom marriage on someone that will not give up on him and divorce him when they get tired or bored? Because if I have held strong to my commitment to be this man's wife over three years of him not talking to me, I'm not going to give up in a marriage. And when you love a man like God loves him, men don't know how to handle that. Men want a trauma bond. They want to marry someone that points at their insecurities so that they feel special to have someone that, that they don't feel worthy of. And to have a woman saying, look, I'm not going to play these games. If you want me here, I am. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to cheat on you. I'm not going to trigger your, your wounds. I'm not going to play head games with you. It's too easy, right? And so is he willing to give up the woman that he's trauma bonding with for the real thing? And that's what God asks you. There's a counterfeit and there's a real. So you have to be able to identify, is this the counterfeit? Is this a, an illusion from the devil or is this God's blessing? And you'll always know because the thing that God's asking of you is something you're not going to want to do. And that's how you know, because it's, it, he's going to make you deny the flesh and go for what you know in your heart is right. So I feel like this is really jumbled, but I wanted to express this and get this out because I'm stepping out on faith about this move and, and the mansion and all that. Um, and that's a big ask. But if I get this, then how encouraging is that going to be for the rest of the world to see that a single mother that really has no money and no way out was able to ask God for this and she got it. And that's going to tell you there are no limits with God. The only limits are within you and your faith and your willingness your willingness to submit. All right. Shabbat Shalom.